for visitors to, oh, mm. every time you say visitors, we have to pay 50 cents or a dollar because you guys are our guests. You're not our visitors. We would love for you to make this home. So if you have any first time guests in the house, if you could just stand real quickly so people can come and hug on you and love on you. They're all in the same corner. So please legacy go and welcome them and hug them. Thank you for coming out in the rain and being with us. Welcome, welcome. You stand for some kind of song. That's a good point. Somewhere in the recordings. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And then second and third time guests, we just want you to wave your hands. We're glad you are still visiting. Next week when you come back, we're going to give you a welcome home card, okay? Just so you know. Um, we had Prophet Kevin Leo come um, last year for our, um, our leadership conference, our builders conference that we do in June. And he was saying, some of you like to sample. No more sampling. You know when you go to the Chinese restaurant and they said, would you like a sample? Would you like a sample? Right? He was cracking us up. He said, no more sampling. No more samples. No more samples. He's just playing, but he's a funny guy. We got to get him back here. He's just amazing and crazy. All right, we're gonna continue the meetings this afternoon. We're gonna postpone them to next week because the rain, I think, is still coming, and we've been advised by security and um, some of our elders that it's better to uh, let out right on time so that you guys can get home. Especially for those, how many of you guys your road was roads were a little rainy, like you had some uh, standing water as you came? Okay, well it was all rainy for everybody, but I mean standing water like it was um, dangerous. Like certain places. All right. Did you come from Virginia or you've been in town? Oh, y'all good, man. You guys are so faithful. Bless you. Yeah. Right, let's pray for them. Extend your hands out to them. Lord, we just bless Jasmine and David, God. And we just bless their faithfulness, Father. And we just declare that even by the end of this month, Father, that a job will open up in this city you will open up a wide space for them. We just declare Isaiah 54, that you have brought in their paid tents, and that you're stretching them wide in this season. And so I just declare that their days of commuting back and forth and having to stay with hosts over the weekend are coming to an end. And I just release a house, not even an apartment, but a house, I just a townhouse, that you guys will be able to rent or even can cause you to buy it. And we just release it even in the next two weeks. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. How many of you guys have been doing the 21-day fast? It's been amazing. Good job. Look at all of you. Amazing. Oh, and you just saw me eating my mint. Or maybe you did it. I can keep it in my mouth. I didn't even think twice. Oh, Jesus. That's what happens when you go on a little, little sleep. It's been amazing. God has blown us away. And one testimony that really blessed me, I mean, we've had crazy ones. People's hair growing in. We prayed for alopecia on uh, Saturday, and she could feel it growing. Um, bumps disappearing, just crazy stuff. But this one girl uh, went to Barnes & Nobles, and she was like, why don't we see the miracles that we're seeing on this phone line every single day? Like, why is it just with this group that these miracles are happening, and it's over a telephone line? Now she was thinking this, someone walked along with crutches and a limp on her leg. And she could feel the pressing of the Lord, like, oh, so <laughs> you've been asking why can't everybody do it, right? So she said she started to get nervous, but she took courage. And she went and prayed for that person, and that person was totally healed. She was actually surprised. She was like, are you feeling better? The person was like, yeah, the pain is gone. And that's the key in the kingdom. We don't just do things. Whatever you do should be multipliable. There's no point in us praying for miracles and we're the only ones doing it. She's not even a member of this church. I don't even know where she is. We have over 4,000 people um, that are part of our group. I don't know how many thousand that are participating. And about 780, depending on the morning, that call in every day. So with that said, capacity for Pioneer Girls is almost there. So most likely we're going to have to move venues. And I, I want to encourage... <laughs> I knew it before we started. 
it, but we have to see the numbers to really know it. So now he has his scrambling around, but God's faithful. Um, yeah, I would encourage you guys, ladies especially. A lot of you guys jumped on the legacy members, but we still have a lot more visitors that have signed up than our actual members, which is fine. Sometimes when you're part of the church, you're like, I get it on Sunday and Wednesday. Why do I need to invest in a conference? Not but me. there are things, not me, right? Say it. I know. I'm just saying, some, some people think like that. It's every, every church. It's like, what, what happens to conferences? Um. But I would encourage you guys not to miss it. We sung The Great I Am earlier. That's by LaRue Howard, and she'll be here. She'll be leading worship Saturday morning. That is not a free session, because sometimes we're just like, oh, we'll go to the free ones at night. We've got some of the heavy hitters during the day uh, this time around, so you want to make sure that um, you invest in that. All right. Let's continue our series, He Makes All Things New. This was a dress down day by default, so forgive my rain boots and jeans, but that's what we're going to do today. Thank you. They don't look like rain boots. Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right. So we're on week three of our series, He Makes, he makes All Things New. We have talked about what that, uh, the precursors of the new thing, what needs to be done before you experience the new thing I talked about last week. Uh, Pastor Soso the previous week introduced us into the new thing and what that looks like. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, the ways that God makes things new. Amen. The ways that God makes things new. My husband's like, mm, because that was not on the <laughs> on our little schedule. But as I was preparing and planning, um, I felt like the Lord was taking us into this um, direction. So the focus on today, though, is going to be on restoration. There are four different ways. everything is making things new but what does that really mean but when we look through scripture there are several ways that God will make something new and the first way that he does is restores and I'll preach on that uh, the next way is that he remains one of the ways that God makes things new is that he remains and there are countless examples in scripture starting with Sarah and Abraham who had to be renamed in order to be ushered into their new thing Amen. Their new thing was their son, who God had prophesied for years and years, the waited and the contended, and it's actually right before the son is born that God encounters them and says, no longer will you be Abraham, Abram, but you will be Abraham. Right. No longer will you be Sarai, but you will be Sarah. And some of us have been having difficulty entering into that new thing because we're still living based off of our old name. And our old names could be anything from you are amazing, right? But it, the name is great, but it's not what God has called you. To names like Jacob. Jacob, this is really crazy to me, and I've taught on this a hundred times. It's one of my favorite identity passages um, in Genesis 29. I'm not giving you this, the scriptures yet because I'm just summarizing. But his mom has a visitation from the Lord that she's going to have twins and that the youngest one is going to be great. Yet, when he comes out holding on to his brother's heel, they decide to name him Jacob, which means deceiver, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you've already gotten this word that you're going to be that your son's going to be great. Yet you name him the total opposite of what should be named. Deceiver, deception is not going to enter you into that great thing, right? Yeah. So he gets named this name, and then he begins to walk it out. Right, He uh, deceives his brother. He takes his birthright. He deceives his father. He puts the hair on his body, and his father blesses him instead of Esau. Yep. He goes, and he meets another deceiver, and this is the thing with names. They create familiar spirits. So when you're named something, so for example, when a person deals with rejection, right? So they believe they're worthless and they, they're not loved, right? What they're going to do is that every relationship that they enter in, even if the person calls them worthy, even if the person says that you are loved, because they believe their name, they're going to walk that out. And so they're going to do things to make that person prove to them that they are worthless and they're not loved. And so Jacob is named Deceiver. And he meets Laban, who's also a deceiver, but it's his uncle. He doesn't meet him. He goes. And uh, 
Laban deceives him out of his first wife. He really wanted to marry Rachel. He gets Leah. Um, until Laban got hit with the game. He gets, he gets Rachel, he gets Leah, and then Laban is like, I don't want you to go anywhere. Jacob is like, I'm ready to leave. I, you know, I've worked for you for all these years. And he says, no, I don't want you to leave. And Jacob says, okay, give me one thing, right? And so he does this whole trick with the speckled animals, and his animals grow and grow and grow until he becomes very rich. Long story short, he finally just has to run away. And this is huge. Because he was up until that point, he was still living out this name that had been given to him that had nothing to do with his destiny. He was living below his destiny even though he had everything that he wanted. He had all these animals. He had the wives that he wanted. He had, you know, it says he was a very, very wealthy man. And sometimes when we have succeeded in specific areas, or maybe we're prophetic, or maybe we have grown in our relationship with God, maybe we have a little bit of money, we can begin to say, oh, well, this is good enough. This is good enough. And then his father gets sick, and he has to go back and see his father before he dies. And so he has to take his whole family, run away in the middle of the day, and there he encounters God. After Laban comes, he encounters God where he wrestles God and God changes his name. Why am I saying all this? We're all on a different path of this journey. Names can be anything. And like I said, they could be good or they could be bad. It could be what, you know, someone just said joking, well, you got a big head, right? Big head with nothing in it. And then all of a sudden, oh, that was a little mean, right? Uh, but people say that. People say that. And then all of a sudden, you, you're, you can't figure things out. You don't succeed in school. I remember people saying, your sister is so much smarter. As a matter of fact, they always said my sister was prettier and was smarter, right? So not they like my natural, my immediate parents. Um, and, but so in my head, I would have this. And now sometimes names can help us out. They can help drive you, right, to succeed, right? So I'm like, okay, I don't have the natural smartness that she does, but I have to work a little bit extra harder. But well, I have a doctorate and she does it. So um, <laughs> she's absolutely brilliant as well. She's in marketing and she's, she's very smart. But sometimes when we're trying to run into the very, like the opposite direction of what people have named us, yeah. it can cause us to uh, enter into um, places that are not for us, yep. right? Yeah. So you yeah. can have succeeded, but God was saying, I'm calling you to lay it all down, right? Yeah. But you're so busy trying to prove that you're not what they said, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we have to examine how much of what I'm living out is actually expectations that people um, had for me versus the expectations that God has for me. Amen. The names that I carry, whether it's, you know, you're smart or you are um, beautiful, right? We, some of us will take on those names. You're so cute. My daughter will tell you, I'm not beautiful, I'm pretty. That, thank her dad for that. Um, <laughs> his daughter pretty for the day she was born. But you take that on as part of your identity. And you begin to live it out. And the Lord is like, yeah, that's nice, but it's not who I've called you. Yeah. I need to rename you. I want to give you a different definition. Yeah. Some people will say, well, people from the islands are this. People from the south are this. People from the west coast are this, right? Yeah. And so sometimes it's not even what you've been individually named when you were being bullied or what your mama said or what your daddy said. Sometimes the culture gives you a name that is not really who you are. And oftentimes we have to identify things and go against it. Mama Joyce gave us a wonderful rebuke, and she can't wait to come back to, to church, hopefully in a couple of weeks, this morning, because we were talking about children on the line, and we were talking about how the kingdom of God talks about children uh, being arrows, and that when we, and even my, my best friend Shami, she was saying, when we get married, we don't say, God, I'm going to have two kids. Our job is to say, God, how many kids do you want me to have? And a lot of times we make these plans because of what the American dream is, right? The white fence, the picket, whatever. And we put God in a little box when God is saying, I have much more than that. And so a lot of times we don't even, they were saying we need to pray about even the number of children that you're going to have. Amen. Stop allowing society to dictate what a perfect life looks like. What a perfect successful man looks like. What a perfect successful uh, woman looks like. There's a different measure of success in the kingdom than in the natural. Amen. And so in order to enter into a new thing, most of us have to take some seasons to wrestle and say, what am I defined by? Amen. Am I defined?
the titles, but God, who do you really say I am? Amen. And that's part of that identity. Until you fully understand that, any new thing that God is trying to bring on the scene, you're not going to be able to enter into it. So you want to deal with the names that you have believed, whether they be positive whether they be negative, and you want to take them up and say, God, I believe that I'm this and I'm that, but is this who you're calling me to be? Because I do not want to miss the new thing because I'm living out somebody else's life and not mine. And we have to remove the pressure. You've got to take off the pressure. You've got to take off the pressure that society puts on you, and you've got to understand what the kingdom of God requires and not what everybody else requires. So rename it. And we could preach on this all day, but I don't have time. The next way that God makes things new is that he resonates. Dead dreams. That when I, I, you know, I feel our victories, we begin to form based on our environment. And so when it comes to dreams and ideas and who God called us to be, we have to take a moment, and I always tell people when I'm coaching them, one of the things that you want to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out your purpose is, what did you want to be when you were little? What did you want to be when you were little? Before everybody told you you couldn't do it. Before everybody said you weren't smart enough or strong enough or you were born in the wrong gender or you were born in the wrong culture, right? Sometimes people say, mom, that happened to my mom. They said, you can't be a lawyer, you're a woman. And so she became a teacher, right? And she always wanted to be a lawyer. So what God does when he's about to enter us into a new thing, and this could be a really uncomfortable place, because he begins to resurrect things that we thought were dead. You'd be like, why do I want to do that again? Why do I want to help people? Why do I feel like I need to go back to school? Why do I feel like I need to, um, you know, extend myself in this area? I, ne you know, when I was little, I wanted to travel the world. Why do I want to do mission trips? Where is this coming from? It's because God is trying to resurrect what he intended in your life a long time time ago. And so part of entering into the new thing is aligning with God's heart for your life from the time that you were little. If there were no limitations, if money, uh, resources, education was not an issue, what would you be doing? That answer is usually the clue to what you were born to do. A lot of times we become what we become based off of the limitations that society presses on us. Well, I really don't have the money, so I'm not going to go to college, right? Or you wanted to be a doctor all your life. Oh, uh, well, I don't know any woman who's ever done this, so I'm not going to do it. We look at the limitations. We look at what other people have not been able to do, and then we make our decisions. But that is so contrary to the nature of God. God doesn't look at your abilities when he calls you into a thing. He doesn't look at how smart you are. He doesn't look at how educated you are. He calls you. because of algebra because of algebra algebra one algebra two was a beast and you guys know me i'm an overachiever extremely di you know driven president of this president of that and my <laughs> oh jesus i may need some therapy i'm rocking um remembering those times <laughs> they were like faith you're repeating algebra two if you don't pass it this semester then you're not going to be able to graduate with everybody else. I was like, Jesus. I mean, I've never studied so hard in my life. I don't even know how I passed it. But I passed it, right? <laughs> Taylor, you know, there's some classes you're just happy you passed them, right? But the craziest thing happened. I get to undergrad, and they give us an assessment for math, English, and science. And do you know I scored the highest out of my group and landed in calculus? I was like, this is a, there is a flock here. There is something really strange. Y'all don't know. I like, you saw my C. I didn't know this. I could not do it. But the Lord had predestined that I was going to be a doctor. He had predestined, predestined it, and I had agreed with it. I already knew that going into undergrad. So I land in calculus. I'll never forget my little uh, teacher's real frail, older white guy. And he worked with me through calculus one, calculus two. And because I landed in such a high um, category, they put me in a different category than all the other psychology majors. 
So I ended up getting a bachelor's of science while the rest of my cohort got bachelor's of arts. And they put me through calculus one, calculus two, chemistry one, cap, uh, chemistry two. And maybe the Lord was preparing me, uh, me for my husband because that's all him right there. Um, but I ended up passing, and that Bachelor's of Science is one of the things that allowed me to get into the doctorate program, because a lot of people didn't have the Bachelor's of Science in psychology. So why am I saying this? When you align with God's heart and God's plan for your life, even the things that were difficult begin to become easy, and he begins to make a way out of no way. In calculus, I cried through it, but I passed it, right? Can Sometimes we quit and we forfeit who we're really named to be. A lot of us take the easy way out. A lot of us take the easy way out. Oh, this is too hard. I don't want to take the GRE. We hear that a lot, right? So I'm just going to apply to these online schools, which half of them are dying. I'm just being frank with y'all. Didn't Argosy or one of them just get flipped upside down? Take the harder way sometimes. Take the harder way sometimes. God is not looking at the shortcuts. He's looking at the full picture of your destiny, and you have everything in you to become and to do what he's called you to do. So if he's, re if he's resurrecting dreams, it means that he wants to call you into a new place. Some of you guys had seen such bad marriages that you made inner vows and said, well, I don't ever want to be married. And then all of a sudden, you're like, well, maybe it wouldn't be so bad, right? I don't want to have any kids. All of a sudden, you're dreaming about kids every other night. God is resurrecting something, and he's going to bring you into that new place if you align with his dreams. I said it on the line. God's dreams don't die until they and alive. He's not looking at your limitations. He's looking at his ability. Through my doctrine, I, the last, I mean, all my life I had to fight. Yeah. All my life. <laughs> just thank God the curse is broken, but I'm telling you, my dissertation. <laughs> I was paired with one professor going in one direction, and then she left. And then they paired me with a military general that was now a teacher. It was a professor. My dissertation was in trauma. God bless you if you're watching. But he was the most... Most different kind of guy. Remember, or what, 2008, we were supposed to have defended and begun. I was still working on my statistics. He was so, like, I almost didn't walk. And they were like, no, you're almost done. You've almost, you've defended most of it. I had to fight and fight and fight. And many times I wanted to be like, that's it. I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. But God has a dream for your life. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. The doors that are opening up, even for our church, wouldn't be opening up right now if I had not been able to persevere the way that I persevered. Uh, we have a, a TV show interview coming up real soon. We'll show you. Uh, yeah. In October, so we'll share with you guys the links and everything when they come out. All right, so he resurrects. He begins to resurrect. He begins to resurrect things. Let's go into restoration, and we'll end there today. Uh, Pastor Soso is going to really deal with. Uh, he's going to deal with redemption and um, resurrection on a on a deeper level, and the way that he does. So let's look at the book of Job. Uh, I mean Joel. Joel chapter two. Let's start uh, at eighteen. All the way to 25. Joel 2. 18, 25. All right. And I'm just going to read it out. This is the NIV. Let me, let me get the New King James. All right. Joel 2, 18 through 25. It says, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. 
But I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land. He's talking to Israel. They've been battered left and right. With his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea, his stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done uh, monstrous things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. For the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, afraid, your beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the trees bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vast shall overflow with new wine and oil. So, and this is our verse that we're focusing on today. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, um, my great army which I sent among you. All right? So we're talking about how God gives us new things by restoring us. All right? There's an amazing article in... Um, Gospel Coalition, it's a um, magazine by Colin Smith, concerning how God makes things new. And so I'm going to be sharing some of those tidbits of what that looks like in our lives. So we know that money can be restored. If you lose money, you can work hard and, you know, earn it back up. We know that property can be restored, even those that have lost their homes even this weekend. Um, it may not be the same, but you could build it up or you can fix it up. Broken cars, we've seen them be restored. Um, stripped painting can be restored. Chairs can be restored. All those things can be restored. But one thing that can never be restored is time. Time flies and it does not return. Years pass and we never get them back. But it's really interesting in Job 2.25, because God promises the impossible. He says, I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. How is it possible to take time and give it back to you? That's what we're going to be looking at. That the Lord became jealous of his land and had pity on his people. This is what was going on. God said, behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. So... In the coming years, God said their fields would yield an abundance that would make up what had been lost. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vast shall overflow with new wine. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. So locusts represent lo lost years. Lo locusts represent lost years. And I'm going to share with you guys some categories of lost years that the Lord is saying that he's going to begin to restore. And as he's restoring those, you're going to enter into a new thing. All right? So we have lost years of our lives. I saw a documentary yesterday of a 14-year-old boy. He's no longer 14 because it's 27 years later. He was in his home in Brooklyn sleeping when the police came knocking at the door and they told him that they had uh, placed him at a, a murder scene. 14 years old. They handcuffed him, took him in, and they put him in a lineup. And the person that came pointed him out. And he spent 27 years in prison for a, uh, a crime that took place while he was sleeping. And they said the detective Scalela or Scalesi, um, he's very corrupt. They have found over 80 um, curses, uh, curses, they are curses, really, cases in which he planted evidence. But how do you do that to a 14-year-old boy? And he said when he went into prison, he didn't even know how to read. But he began to read and he began to study. And as he read, actually, I was thinking about our, our um, Books for Bars program. I, I want to send him some books. But uh, as he began to read and study, he began to learn. And he said they can lock up my body, but they can't lock up my mind. And he fought for himself, fought for himself until finally they exonerated him. And so now he has this program where he brings books into jails and um, in prisons. But those are, that's an example of lost years of your life. Another example could be sickness. Sickness may have crippled you as a child. And maybe you weren't able to really live it out uh, the way that you wanted to um, live it out. Uh, you could feel like you lost uh, years being married to somebody <laughs> that you were supposed to be married with too. And your spirit died and your soul died, right? 
So locusts can represent the lost years of our lives, and this comes in a number of ways. They also represent lost years. Um, those are the fruitless years. So you're alive, but you're not being fruitless. I mean, you're not being fruitful. Lo locusts represent the lost years in which we are fruitless. A lot of hard work was done in the years the locusts had eaten. So the locusts had something to eat because the farmers had been working. They had been planting. And they built up all this stuff. It's like when there was that um, market crash back in 2008 and 2009, where all these people had invested in different portfolios and different things, and all of a sudden, everything that they had worked for was gone. Yeah. The locusts came and ate what they had caused, they had been toiling for, and it made them to be fruitless. And so some of us, we're believing God for a new thing because we've been working in some areas or we've been building in an area and nothing of our own fault we've, uh, we've lost. Now we've caused things that we thought were going to be fruitful uh, to be fruitless. A lot of hard work was done in those years. After everything was destroyed, the people must have thought, all this work, uh, what do I have to show for it? How many of us have said that? All this work, uh, what do I have to show for it? Some of you know this pain especially in the world of business, right? We have failed ventures, we have bad investments, we have misguided policies, um, and all an effort you put in the day-to-day -day work and then things fall apart. God wants to restore that. Loc loc locusts, I can't say the word today, locusts also represent the lost years which are connected to pain. So painful years. So these are the people who maybe lost a loved one and it took them two, three, four years to get back to normal. Or these are the people that maybe went through a divorce and it took two years of trying to get themselves back to really focus. Um, the pain, when you have something painful happen to you and it caused to not numb you. It could be someone who was molested and they've been pretty much disassociated most of their you know, early uh, lives. I'll counsel people and they'll be like, I don't remember that. I don't remember anything from my childhood because they repress those memories. And so locusts will come and inflict pain so that you can lose years so that you're not fruitful. I'm thinking of those who have lost loved ones, you have plans for the future, but now you, you're fear, and this is Colin speaking, you fear the coming years uh, may be empty. And sometimes when we have a loss, we are not able to enter into the next year and the next year because the loss causes us to lose hope. So, oh. I don't have any money to move forward anyway. And so what we do is just live our life, but not really live it meaningfully. Yeah, yeah. I lost everything anyway when you cheated on me, right? And so therefore there's no need to hope. There's no need to build again. These are painful years. I'm thinking also of those who live with illness in the body or the mind. You assume that you would always be able to do what you used to do. You have to find a way to live with the disappointment that you cannot. Lost years are selfish years. Um, and here's a story that he shares that I want to read to you guys. He says, there's a person who made a commitment to Christ, but it didn't run deep. Faith in Jesus was a slice of the big pie of his busy life, filled with all the things that he wanted to pursue. Then one day, God gets a hold of him, and he's spiritually awakened. He says to himself, what in the world have I been doing? Sometimes our lost years are years before we came into the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes our lost years are the years we spend in religious churches and we don't understand who we are, what God has called us to do, and we never fully step into our assignment. I served, I gave, I was there when it opened, I was there when it was closed, and nobody ever told me who I was. Nobody gave me an opportunity. We hear this all the time. All these years, I've never heard teaching like this. wants to restore them. It was not in vain. You have the years that are what we call the loveless years. God wants to restore the loveless years. And this is Colin um, speaking again. A division comes to a family alienating loved ones. Children grow up and those years cannot be recovered. That's why you've got to forgive. I can't stay mad for nothing. I mean, I try. I've tried it with my husband. I'm like, oh, 24 hours. We're acting like we're not talking. By the, I mean, by probably the 30 second hour, I'm like, all right, we just got to talk about this, right? But some of us can be mad for two weeks, three years. I'm not talking to them. 
shut everything down. And we're actually proud of it. We're actually proud of it. Those are lost years. And then you're going to be praying, God, do a new thing. Reclaim my time. Do something new in my marriage. Well, you used to shut that person down every time you argue. But he's saying that the Lord can restore even the loveless years. A marriage quietly endures in which love has been burning low for many years, right? So we've been married, but maybe there's no love there. We're just going through the motions. You see a couple who are really in love and you say, I wish I could be loved like that. Or you have not yet met the person you'd like to meet. It feels like the years are moving on and you can never get them back. The locusts have eaten them. God wants to restore them. Then we have what we call the rebellious years. Even God, the wonderful God can restore the rebellious years that we cause ourselves to enter into. When we were in rebellion, not because of anybody else, but because of our own choices. That's right. That's right. Perhaps you grew up with many blessings, but in your heart you wanted to rebel. You didn't fully understand this urge, but you gave yourself to it. Or you didn't grow up with any blessings, and you were mad at the whole world, and you were like, forget it. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. Yeah. Or you prayed once, and God didn't answer, and you're like, God doesn't hear me. I don't care. I'm just going to do me. Right? Because we all like to throw temper tantrums. I was there. God, save me from this. I don't want to keep seeing this guy because I don't want to live in sin. God, just save me. And then the person calls. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? Okay, yes, we'll meet up. No. <laughs> you're, you're making that decision. God's not going to save you. He may have saved you the night that you prayed, but you've got to walk it out. You've got to walk it out. So instead of us bringing pleasure to the Lord and walking with him, we rebel. And it brings us a lot of pain. Some of us, we were, you know, people use drugs and it impacts their brain, impacts their body. And so they've lost years. Uh, some people um, end up in, you know, jail or they end up losing a lot of money because they gamble. Their rebellion causes them to lose things. God is even willing to restore the, these things. The Israelites were in the desert because of their rebellion. And he had mercy on them. That's what it talks about in Job 2. And he began to have mercy on them. All right, we're getting there. We're almost there. Lost years or misdirected years. These are the misdirected years. They told me that I should be doing this, and I listened because I trusted them. And I was in the wrong path the whole time, right? Or I, I knew that I should make this decision, but the pressure was so much from this that I did what they directed me to do. And I have lost all these years. The path you choose in your career or at a college may have been a dead end, right? So I thought this is what everybody was doing. So I chose it, but I'm more in debt now. I'm struggling. And I, in my head, I knew I was supposed to go in a different direction. This goes back to what I was talking about, the dreams that God has for you. They're much cheaper on your life. When you live out your own dreams, they're going to cost you. It costs you. And so aligning with God's heart oftentimes will not lead you to a dead end. Right. But aligning with your own desires will. So there are things that can happen um, that cause you to live in a place of misdirection. Often in your mind and sometimes in your conversation, you say things like, how did I end up here? If only I had made that move. Shout out to all y'all that have made the big move down here. We have a lot more coming. Bless you. If only I had taken that opportunity. If only I had chosen a different path. Yeah. So guess what? God does not only restore the years, he heals regret. Mm -hmm. God does not only restore the years, he heals regret. Yeah. Because those if onlys are places of regret. Yeah. And when God does a new thing, there is no shame, there is no pain, and there is no regret. When you enter into a new thing, you know that you've entered into a new thing because the shame and the regret is no longer there. You can joyfully enter. Years. The years that we didn't know him. The years when we were in darkness. God wants to restore all those things. So quickly, this is how God restores the years and how he enters and ushers us into a new thing. In Joel 2, 27, uh, it says, You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I, that I am the Lord. Earth. 
He says, I want you to know my voice. I want you to understand how I work. I want you to know that I have loved you, that even though you've been in the desert, even though you were misdirected, even though you rebelled, even though you experienced pain, I have been with you from the beginning of time. In order to enter into a new thing, you must understand that God is with you and has always been there for you. One of the things that we do in theophostic therapy is that we take the person, let's say they uh, were uh, beat by their dad. And we'll say, and you can't, don't do this if you don't know how to do the techniques, please. Right. You'll get people stuck in places they don't need to be stuck. But Tell me what he's doing. Because a lot of times when we go through trauma, when we go through brokenness, we feel like we're just doing it by ourselves. We feel like God has forgotten. And when you can begin to see Jesus in your broken places, those broken places can begin to heal. If you can begin to see Jesus in your broken places, those broken places can be healed. And so when you take some comprehend everything that you have done up until this moment. So he will call you into deeper communion with him. The next thing that God does to restore the series on pruning, or we talked about pruning. The harvest is that the locusts had eaten by giving them what we call a bumper crop or a bumper harvest. That's when in one year, your salary doubles or triples, right? It's possible. Yes. We're living testimony. Not on salary and are not part of our church. We'll be like, oh my gosh, you guys bought the house because you planted the In being faithful in the talents that he has given us, and he has given us a bumper crop. Yes. And so out of your obedience and out of your communion, you will find that God begins to give you double. And you begin to see, I mean, there are things that we are able to do for our kids that my mom so wished she could do, including crab legs. I'm like, y'all want crab legs really for dinner? I didn't eat crab legs till I was 19. I couldn't afford them. I couldn't afford them. But there is a place when we learn that God will restore us, that we also see him restoring even our family line, or even our bloodline. We begin to walk in things that they couldn't walk in. I'm working really hard right now because I want to I wanna pay for my mom's trip to Europe. She uh, you know, just had a back issue. And I'm like, I really would love to bless her with this trip. You know why? Because she has years and years that the enemy has stolen. But when we are renewed, when we're walking in communion, we can bless our parents with those things. We can bless the harvest or the bumper harvest. The provision makes me think, this is Colin speaking, about the parable where Jesus spoke about a harvest that could be 30, 60, and 100 fold. That is how God restores time. He causes things that will just be 30 come forward in 100. You get overtaken by the blessings of the Lord. Or let me give you one example. I'm going to end it uh, on time, I promise. We have an Uncle Jack who we absolutely love. And uh, he was married for a really long time and, you know, believes for children. Some of y'all know this story. No children. And he was married to this person for 25 years. Finally, that person left. And uh, he got a new wife. And she got pregnant, just like that. Wow, wow. And, they, and they go to the hospital, and the uh, doctor's like, oh, I see one, two, three babies. And he fell out, <laughs> fainted, <laughs> right there on the ground. <laughs> and they told him, wake up, you got to work so you can feed these babies. <laughs> but not only that, during those waiting, he had adopted a little girl. His new wife had a little girl. And now they have three little girls. In the span of two years, he went from no children to like five children, right? Or three, I don't know the exact number of years. But then after that, they said, well, let's try for a boy. Ended up with another girl. They got six babies, and he's the happiest man, six, six girls, that has ever lived. That is how God restores time. He said, oh, I'm married. It was so 
such a bad thing and then he gives you the most amazing wife, right Dexter? He gives you the most amazing wife. It gives you the most amazing blessing and you're like, oh my gosh, I know I waited forever, but this is like a dream come true. And there's a scripture where it says that they sat by the river and they said, this is like as if we had dreamt. And that's how you know you've entered into a new thing. It literally feels like you are dreaming. Could this really be happening? All right? So he, he uh, multiplies your fruitfulness. And he also gives you strength to work and be productive more than you were before. God can restore lost years by bringing long-term gain from short-term loss. The effect of these great trials in your life will be that it tested the genuineness of your faith so they may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The praise, glory, and honor go to Christ because his power guarded you and kept you through the hardest times of your life. Thinking about years that the locust has eaten, years that have been taken, I think of something that Isaiah said about the Lord. He has cut, he has cut off out of the land. Well, he was cut off out of the land of the living. So when God restores years by bringing long-term gain, from short-term loss. And this is when you learn how to see God in everything that is going on in your life, right? So you can say, you know what? I really wanted to go to that school. I didn't get in. It really hurt me. But I went here instead, and look what the Lord has done. I really wanted him to marry me, but he, he broke off the engagement. And I met this person instead, and look what the Lord has done. And so what God does is he takes the short-term pain and gives you long-term pain. Okay. He's a restorer of all things. We can stand on our feet. Thank you, Lord. So make sure you encourage your friends that couldn't make it today to watch um, watch the stream. We all want to enter into this new thing together. It's on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube. Go like our, our YouTube um, channel. We're building that up as well. But God, we just thank you. Just raise your hand. And I just want you to begin to thank God. Thank you, Jesus, that you're bringing us into a new thing by restoring the old things. God, we thank you, Father, that whatever the locusts have eaten, the time, the years, God, that we had given over, Father, to things that were not your plan, the dreams that we had lived out that were not your dreams, or the names that we had lived by that were not your names, God, the vows that we had made because of our situations that caused us to wander around, God. Lord, we thank you for the years that are coming, the years of the bumper crop, God. We thank you for the years of long-term gain, God, we thank you for the years of restoration, Jesus. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy, Father. And you make all things new. You can do the impossible. You can take what time has taken and given it back to us, God. You renew our strength, God. You cause us up to mount up on wings as eagles, God. You cause us to take flight, God. Those that are weary, Father, you encourage their hearts, God. Those that have been mourning, God, you wipe their tears, Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that you're strengthening us even right now. God, we thank you that you're taking us from glory to glory. Lord, we thank you that we never have to live in that dead place, God. Lord, we thank you that you're taking us out of the barren place, God. Lord, we thank you for the years of restoration that are ahead of us, God. Everything that Everything our flat life stole. God, we thank you. And we take it back right now. We take it back right now. What the enemy took from our parents. What our enemy took from our grandparents. God, we thank you that you will restore it. Not only in our generation, but our generations to come.
glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus. Let us prepare our offerings. If you have your offerings ready, let's go ahead and bring our offerings up. If you want to give by text, you can text give to number 919-586-8898 and we'll follow the prompt. You can also give to Legacy Center Church on Square Cash or you can go to Legacy Center Church at ORG and follow the giving prompt. Amen. Would you key in um, the, the giving um, declaration? After we've given our gifts, we're going to go ahead and recite and, you know, declare over our giving. And we're going to close and we're going to be out of here. If you all join me as we stand to declare. Amen. Let's read. Thank you for the honor to give to you, Father. I bring my life in gratitude as a living sacrifice which is my reasonable service. In worship, I bring also of my gifts, ingenuity, and possessions. I am a kingdom facilitator. I am the hands and feet of Jesus. As a salt of the earth, I will preserve it. I will nurture it. I will mature it. Every resource I need to move in this realm so you have provided to me. I receive of the cattle of a thousand hills. I work in an assurance of all sufficiency. I am anxious about nothing, for as the earth produces its abundance and technologies and businesses spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations through me. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Father, we just thank you for this week. We thank you for the word that has come forth. We just thank you for even the weather. We speak peace. We speak peace over this region. We speak peace, O Lord God, over this old, the old North Carolina, South Carolina, the Carolinas, and even towards the Northeast in the coming week. Father, we thank you because, Lord, your peace, your peace reigns over this old atmosphere, over the old earth, God. And Lord, we ask, O Lord God, that you restore everything that has been lost, God, even in this season. Lord, even hope, hope, something we have lost hope. 
that you will restore hope in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your goodness over the house. We thank you for your love. We just bless you, Jesus. You're a good, good father to, to us. We honor you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our guest, real quick, you can stay for a couple minutes. We want to love on you. We want to hug you. And please um, join us on the back to the left of your turn for a quick refreshment and a hug.